So welcome everybody to the Banyan Books and Sound podcast in conversation. I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Dr. Martin Shaw. He has introduced thousands of people to mythology and over the last 20 years has guided many, many people through wilderness rites of passage. He devised and led the oral tradition course at Stanford University. He's author of the Myth Teller Trilogy. Recently, he published Courting the Wild Twin out with Chelsea Green. And he also released The Night Wages through his new small press, Sista Mystica. Martin Shaw, thank you so much for joining us. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, now, given that we're in a very interesting time and place with the coronavirus uh, worldwide, I was going to read a piece that you wrote recently on this particular issue and let that be our entry point. Fantastic. I've had it. So I'll do my best here to do your words justice. It's titled Keeping the Smoke Hole Open. Seek vigil, not isolation. In Siberian myth, when you want to hurt someone, you crawl into their tent and close the smoke hole. Mm. That way God can't see them. Close the smoke hole and you break connection to the divine world. Mountains, rivers, trees. Close the smoke hole and we become mad. Close the smoke hole and we are possessed by ourselves and only ourselves. Close the smoke hole and you have only your neurosis for company. Well, enough of that. Really, come on. We're grown-ups. Let's take a breath. <laughs> we may have to seek some solitude, but let's not isolate from the marvelous. High alert is the nature of the moment, and rightly so, but I do not intend to lose the reality that as a culture, we are entering a deeply mythic ground. I am forgetting business as usual. No great story begins like that. What needs to change? Deepen. Mm. What kindness in me have I so abandoned that I could seek relationship with again? It is useful to inspect my ruin. Could I strike up an old relationship with my soul again? You don't need me to tell you how to keep the smoke hole open. You have a myriad of ways. We are awash with the power of words, virus, isolate, pandemic, and they are pointing towards very real things. To some degree, we need the organizational harassment of them. But do they grow corn on your tongue when you speak them? Where is the beauty making in all this? This is part, part of the correct response. The absolute heft of grief may well be the weave to such a prayer mat. Before we burn the whole world down in the wider range of climate emergency, of which this current moment is just a hint, could we collectively seek vigil in this moment? Cry for a vision. It's what we've always done. We need to do it now. Lots of love, Martin. Mm. Well read, man. Yeah. Well written. Thank you. I've been a wilderness rites of passage guide for getting on for 20, 25 years. And I've never seen a moment quite like this one before where we are culturally heading into the kind of ground you get when you go out into the forest or on the top of a mountain or by a river to find what the philosophers, an Irish philosopher, John Moriarty, calls your bush soul, B-U-S-H, your bush soul. And it's, it's sort of extraordinary. It's a, an initiation on a scale that people of my age, which is under 50, most of us haven't seen anything quite like this before, um, which means there's an extraordinary divine possibility in it. But 
there was also an addictive quality to chaos. There's an addictive quality to panic. And people that I know and respect have gone way past just knowing the facts about coronavirus and have moved into a place where they're, it's like they're sucking on the tit of the thing and it's making them a little crazy. So I think as parents and I think as community members, to some degree, especially where our kids are concerned, we should be gatekeepers and really consider the amount of information and hysteria that we bring into the house. That doesn't mean that we underplay the significance. But what is so crucial is that we don't lose what William Blake used to call pinpricks of the eternal in all of this. So in other words, there are always moments where if you feel the hysteria rising, it means you're out of touch with the timeless. The time bound has possessed you. The facts of the matter have possessed you. But actually the push and pull of great storytelling, the push and pull of myth is that you stay connected to deeper currents. And that image of the smoke hole being closed, that really is from a Siberian story where a tribal group try and assassinate a woman. And that's how they do it. They don't want God to see them try and kill her. So when you close the hole to the divine world, you're no longer accountable. But for me, I see attempts to close that hole all the time. And I really know in my life, when I'm disconnected from that wider world, and it's not just a heavenly world, it's the reason why I said rocks and rivers and trees. It's the one we're in. Heaven's here. Um, when I lose connection to that, I go way past um, grief, which we know is something fertile and inevitable, and I just get frozen in a kind of despair. Despair is a big conversation, but from my point of view, raising a kid as a, as a dad, uh, there is a limit to how much of that I'm going to bring into the house. So those few words were written for me. I'm now, this is what, day um, 10 or 11, I think, of just being here alone in my little cottage. Because once I've got through 14 days, I can then be reunited with my daughter again. So I'm just grinding my way through this. And I wrote that to make sure that I remembered to keep that kind of perspective open on this as I began my sit, in a way. So... My understanding of what you just said is we need to hold that paradox of the timeless and the time bound in a, in a moment in history like this and, and strike that balance between acknowledging the realities and also being able to step back and witness the divine unfolding and all of it. Yeah. Now I'm not for a moment suggesting a kind of um, passivity I'm not suggesting uh, that, you know, everything is one and nothing is a problem. This, yeah. is, this is a really scary <laughs> moment for a lot of us. But, um, you know, this is part, you know, people, people use that word Gaia and this blissful expression comes on them. But this is part of the movement of the earth. It always has been. The issue now is it's suddenly become a first world issue. So people with my pigment are breaking out in sweat saying, how can it possibly be happening to me? Not realizing that, you know, you get past Suez and, and stuff like this is happening a lot. So, of course, it's a wake up call. The question is going to be, as we, as we culturally head into the underworld, do we have the language to address what is trying to reveal itself? So in other words, I think you're right. Stories are a mix of the timeless and the time bound. They want the creak of your elbow and the jut of your belly and the grief in your heart, the stuff you get marked out by life. But at the same time, you need this other ingredient that is more than just that, that is more than just um, your circumstance. So I'm trying to figure out at the moment 
the mythic thinking that is trying to express itself through this. And there'll be millions of other people trying to do similar things. I'm not uh, raising myself up actually in that, but that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm listening actually. Interestingly, as a storyteller, most of what you need to do is not talk, but just listen appropriately. Yes. So this, this reminds me of, I, I was reading the intro to your new book, um, Courting the Wild Twin, and you talk about this condition of wondering. Mm, yeah, perfect. Is that what the, this condition, maybe you can speak a bit to that and, and how that works. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a new book, uh, Chelsea Green, you mentioned it, uh, Courting the Wild Twin. You know, usually uh, if you get a, a writer to talk about their publisher, like a, a musician talks about his record company, they're usually just full of complaints. But <laughs> working with this bunch has been so fantastic. And it, it has uh, renewed my enthusiasm for publishing. Although my old publishers, uh, White Cloud with Steve Scholl were great as well. So I just wanted to say that. But uh, wondering... I lived in a tent for four years and I used to wander around and I had no phone or computer or anything like that. And one of the things that I would do is that I realized in the words of the philosopher Gaston Bachelard, that the world seeks to be admired by us. A rowan tree is trying to get your attention if you have the eyes to behold it. And so the wondering came from recognizing that a lot of the things around me, and this is going to sound very bardic, but that's kind of the tradition I'm in. They have secret names that are not Latin ones. Mm -hmm. They have names and information they want to give to you uh, to repeat if you have the eyes to behold them. So the condition of wondering is perfect for storytelling. It's perfect for myth. Myths that are not us telling us a myths that are not us looking at the earth and telling the earth what it is but stories where you feel the earth themselves within the tale showing us something about them i'm sure you can detect the difference yes we, we want to hear in 2020 we need stories from the land not the landowner you know, that's partially what's got us into this condition. So wondering is the number one thing. Beautiful. That what you just said reminds me of uh, a quote I pulled where you said, bad storytellers make spells, great storytellers break them. Yeah. And that seems to me like that might arise from the, the listening to what's coming from the land itself versus the landowner imposing. That's it. I, I have a lot of students that are interested in the craft of what you could call oral thought, speaking out loud, imagining in public, as it were, which is the kind of storytelling that I like. And all I ever look for from a storyteller is her capacity or his capacity to try and tell the truth in the way that is indigenous to them. Hmm. Try and find a wild way of telling the truth. Um, I don't think we need more theater necessarily. We don't need more theatrics. We don't need more, we don't need bad acting, but there's a currency to story that when you hear it, without the use of facts, as my friend Danny Deardorff used to say, without the use of facts, you're in the presence of a greater truth. Mm. Isn't, that, isn't it interesting? You're like, wow, I'm actually hearing the true story that's underneath the hysteria and the so-called facts of the matter. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just thinking... Uh, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Sorry. Because what what, what I'm, my understanding of what you just said is you're pointing to the, this underlying essence that can maybe be pointed to and felt in the heart, but is, is much deeper and more prevalent than the facts dancing on top. That's it. 
The old idea is that most of a human being's soul lives outside of their body. Hmm. So that very Western thing where I sort of gesture here somewhere as like, well, this is where my heart lives. This is where my psyche is. To a Kalahari Bushman, you are dwelling within soul when you're on walkabout. And when I was about 23, uh, I went up on a mountain in Wales and I got kind of broken open after four days of fasting. And that was the great revelation of that experience was that I do have an interior, but that interior is both inside me and outside, paradoxically. So there's all sorts of information for us about how to live, how to behave, responses to questions we may have that actually you get from simply paying attention to the wider world. So what you're pointing to here is how is the intersection point of the personal journey, the mythic journey and the wild of the, of the earth itself. Yes. Um, you could probably, if you had more time, phrase it a little more poetically than that. <laughs> that is, I, I, it's, you know, we, we work on this stuff, man, you know. Uh, I, I, think, I think that that's it, as, you know, technically speaking, yeah. Right, in a very technical, yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry to break form here. All right. Where, so given the wondering that you're doing right now, have you come to any poetic conclusions about where, in terms of myth, is there one, is there a particular story or myth that strikes you as um, significant to this time that we're in? There's an image, probably not the whole story, but I'll give you an image. Uh, long time ago, there was a Russian prince. He's the third son of the Tsar. And he has to go out into the world to find his brothers who've gone missing. And he comes to a great forest. And next to the forest, there is a rock. And inscribed on the rock, it says this. If you go left, you will die, but your horse will live. If you go right, your horse will die, but you will live. Hmm. You die that way, you go this way, the horse dies. He turns right. A couple of days pass. He's almost forgotten about the situation when suddenly, out of nowhere, a wolf comes drags the horse down, kills the wolf, and then says to the young guy, he says, guess what? This is no longer a horse time. This is a wolf time. And if you want to survive it, you're going to have to get on my back now. And he jumps on the back of the wolf and he gets let, launched into this extraordinary, dramatic adventure where he's brought into the presence of the deep feminine and he makes all the correct mistakes and it goes on. But I do believe um, that we're entering wolf time now. Here's an interesting thing. I, I've told almost no one about this. The Corona virus began just as I returned from a 101 day ceremony where I had been going in solitude to the forest where I live every day and leaving a particular libation. And the reason I was doing it was to find out in this time of climate emergency, anything that the earth itself maybe wanted to whisper into my curly little ear. And a lot happened out there. It was the most extraordinary experience, but it's wild now to have just come out of that encounter and see everybody being drawn in to their own initiatory zone. And the 101 days that I spent out there have sensitized me ahead of time, as you can well imagine, to approach what's going on now. But I would be foolish to make too many big statements about it, other than I really would say, this is a time where the, the steadiness of the horse has to be replaced by the roughness and the agility and the profound wildness of the wolf. 
and I will have more to say about that soon. Wow. That is, uh, it seems like quite significant timing indeed. Mm. Mm. One, one thing, it, it, I'm jumping a bit here, but this is a question that I, I definitely wanted to ask you. This term uh, longing that I've, I've seen a lot in your work. Yeah. Can you just comment a little bit on that, that condition of longing? Well, maybe I'm just unlucky in love, you know. I don't know if that's why I like it a lot. I'm not sure. Um, here's a lovely Rumi, uh, the great Persian poet, says this uh, via my friend Coleman Barks, the translator. He says, Longing is the sensation in your chest of God speaking back to you, longing is the return journey. So all that unrequited stuff that you go through as a teenager, although the immensity of feelings you have is actually already a divine response for the profound wonder and incompleteness of living in this world at all. So in other words, it has use. Longing is not wasted time. You know how parents, they look at you when you're kind of wasting away and reading WB Yeats and crying. Actually, there's a... There's an appropriateness to it. God is already dwelling within your heart and stirring your pot. So I figured out years ago that the greatest poems were written not by the poet that got the last kiss. It was written by the poet that didn't. And I'm interested in how we curate longing as human beings and as a culture without it devouring us. I'm not suggesting that you constantly become addicted to backing horses that can't possibly accomplish them themselves, because that is a kind of weirdly um, addictive behavior. But there has to be a place where, in the, in the Irish tradition, they'd say, you make an altar in your heart for the bird that has flown away. Hmm. You make an altar in your heart for the bird that has flown away. It is a wonderful thing in this life to experience fullness and satisfaction. It is also a very deep thing that certain things you prayed that would be delivered for you weren't. And most cultures really worthy of the name earn their insight not by what they gained, but what they were able to live without for the good of others. That is a very middle-aged realization for me at the moment, that more and more the things that I value in my own life, and if I have any respect for myself, it comes not from any sense of accomplishment, it's about what I was prepared to quietly put down for the good of people around me who I love. That's a little bit about longing. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose in a time like this, the opportunity for longing is more potent for many people. Yeah, because we're not being uh, stuffed up with immediate satisfactions. You know, God, God only knows what will happen if Amazon stopped delivering books every day and <laughs> my, you know, my thing out there. Um, yeah, we're learning when you're fasting on the hill, the reason that you go four days and nights without food is not uh, as some macho display. It's not to, um, it's not even really a form of severity. It, it's that you fill yourself with dusk and with dawn and the hundred thousand stars and the very murmurations of the forest. You empty yourself, in other words, for a period of time. And when a forest, for example, has watched human beings come in for hundreds of years and size the trunks of a tree up for a boat or for something else they want to build, it is a radical agency when you just come in and sit down and you willingly give something up for a little bit. 
you're going to long for many things when you're out there in the forest. And that in itself, as I said, has a kind of um, currency to it. It seems to be noticed by the, the wider world. Hmm. So what, how, how do you suggest for anybody in our audience, um, how can they approach this right now? Like there's n nobody can do much other than maybe go out and spend some time in nature. If you're in the city, in the park, yeah. how, how might people put this into practice in their lives and, and um, start to dive into this practice? You know, I, I'm a little sensitive. I do. I can hear where you're going. Uh, I'm a little sensitive to the word practice too quick. Okay. Because in a way, maybe the practice is sitting with the unease of this for a bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the thing to do is to not, I don't want to kind of franchise anything too quick. I don't want to run in and say, well, if you listen to a story in the morning and then you take a jog around the park, you're going to feel pretty good by the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. so actually, what I'm avoiding at this moment is a maintenance program. Yeah. It's a bit different for children. Uh, a little, I feel a little differently about kids. Yeah. But for, for folks of my age, it's like, let's feel the disquiet of this. Let's feel the urge to sate ourselves all of the time. Uh, let's, let's have a look at that. And so right now, before I would recommend anything too swiftly, um, we deserve to be a little uncomfortable. Here's why. Um, most mythologists and storytellers will tell you this in one fashion or another, that our souls are not convinced by the victory stories we give it. So oddly, our achievements, all the stuff that we write on our CV, our soul is indifferent to because it simply doesn't have the depth attached to it. Soul, and to be in proximity to soul, for me, is usually not without pain. It's not necessarily without a certain discomfort. So actually, right now, other than certain things that I'm getting on with. I'm, I'm just sitting here and allowing myself to feel the uncomfortableness of it and whatever will develop will come from there. Got it. Thank you. There's no shortcuts. And actually this, this reminds me of another quote that I pulled from, um, you said, you know, you don't want to encourage people to, to dive right into some form of practice or do this to make yourself feel better. Yeah. Not taking shortcuts in your, in your new book, I pulled a quote that said, be skeptical of the quick route. It's truly what has got us into a thousand unruly messes and not the kind the poets praise. Yeah. There's a story of Alexander the Great you know, the great hero, he came into a city and he was presented with a knot. Think of a rope all tied up in these intricate ways. And they said, whoever can undo this rope may hear the secret name of Dionysus, the great God. In other words, if you can display the patience to work on that Gordian knot, you're going to you're going to achieve wisdom. And Alexander got his sword out and cut the knot right down the middle. Now it's interesting, um, since that moment, that is usually used as an illustration of a time where you just need to cut something. But I never experienced the story like that. Hmm. It's ironic that actually, um, Alexander died a few years later by drinking bad wine. Uh, and of course, with the Dionysian connection, that's not completely lost on me. But I'm a fan of the knot. I'm a fan of doing the work, doing the labor, sitting there, because that's how you get initiated. 
you get initiated. There's a story, as a fairy tale called The Six Swans. And the only way that a young girl can help her, um, her brothers who've become swans is she has to make them shirts of very delicate flowers. And she sits out in the wood every day and she blows it. She tries to make a shirt, it disintegrates. Tries to make a shirt, it disintegrates. While she's doing it, she's under instruction not to speak or to wipe the tears from her eyes. In other words, she really has to bring her energy in. And I have to say at the moment, one of my guiding images is for me to be like that young woman. I'm sitting out there in my solitude, in the wood, doing this delicate thing that, I, that keeps unraveling in front of me. I'm not taking my sword out at the moment. So actually when I say it's got us into the trouble we're in now, I think the trouble begins with Alexander and that blade. Hmm. Is, this a, is this a generational thing with the younger generation with technology and instant gratification being such a norm that it's just an unknown to the younger generation of what it actually takes to unravel those inner knots and the quality that's required for, um, I don't want to say results, the fruits of a committed long-term labor. Yeah. Then they're, they're not seen as sexy or fashionable qualities at the moment for sure. But the one thing I would want to say in defense of the youth is that actually, in my experience, although it seems like there is an enormous divide between tech savvy kids born since 2000 and your uncle who could fix anything that you ever gave him, that seems like a, a big world. But actually, what I notice is as soon as a few of the screens disappear, as soon as you put young people in a hot spot, which could be the bush, it could be away from technology, there is a fundament of depth in them that is just waiting to come forward. So don't, you know, I say this to all mums and dads, don't despair when it seems as if you can never get your kid off their screen and they're playing a particular game. What is the deity standing behind the computer game? Who are they in service to at that moment? What part of their brain is working like a magician? Now, the problem these days is that we are in, I think, there is something of a superficiality to the kind of um, scattered possibilities we have of, you know, uh, we're doing one thing with one hand, we're doing one thing with the other. Um, we are a meeting right now you could say we're meeting the goddess of limit. Mm -hmm. Right now we are in the presence of the goddess of limit. And that makes people very uncomfortable when they've had a panorama of opportunity their, their own life, their whole life. But actually what I do tend to see is that although superfici superficially there's discomfort, usually in time, underneath the surface, uh, young people are looking for a deeper life, actually. They are looking for a deeper life, a lot of them. So that's what I try and bear in mind when I'm feeling curmudgeonly and ancient myself. <laughs> if, we're to, if we were to look at the, the Western culture as, a, as a, um, a being and say within the landscape of mythic story and uh, storyline, the arc, in your estimation, would you dare to guess where we are at in that arc? I, I wouldn't, no. <laughs> um, one of the things that I always say is that as human beings, we're not lived by a myth we're lived by myths, plural. Right. We have competing narratives going on in us all the time. Different deities want different things from us. You know, uh, the artist in you has a very different uh, set of motor skills to the accountant. 
and you can kind of move beyond that into more primordial images. But no, I feel, to be honest, there's two or three stories probably playing themselves out at the, the same time. As I said earlier on, at the moment for me, the notion of moving from an era of the horse to the era of the wolf is very real. The language I'd use to describe that is this. We are culturally moving from pastoral stories to prophetic stories. What does that mean? Pastoral stories confirm what we already know. They confirm the choices that we've made. Prophetic stories are much more difficult to pin down. They have difficult conclusions to them. Sometimes you don't quite know where they begin and where they end. Um, they can disturb and they can rattle the cage. At different times in your life, you need different stories. So, for example, uh, if, I'm, if I was presiding over a funeral, it would be a pastoral story that I would tell at that moment because we are gathering round a friend and we are wrapping them in the swan feather cloak of language to send them on their way. That is a beautiful, confirming thing to do. But if I'm to talk at depth, convincingly, about where we are now, it is the prophetic that needs to speak. It's prophetic reasoning that sent me into the forest for 101 days, you know. Uh, I needed to really get struck by lightning again in a way. Uh, but that means that the things that you say, if you have to use a, a Christian phrase, if you have a prophetic ministry, you don't usually have a very big congregation because <laughs> it, it alarms people. They feel they're getting fried. But right now, pastoral is what got us here. But prophetic is what we need. In the old Native American stories, coyote, coyote's power doesn't live in the normal places. It doesn't live just in his heart or in his chest or in his mind. Coyote's power lives on the tip of his nose and the very end of his tail, the very end of his brush. Uh, again, coyote times, you know. Mm. Mm. How do we make beauty out of all this? What, what, what's the role of the, the bard, the storyteller, or the beauty maker in, in society right now? Storytellers traditionally have a contract. And the contract with the tribe is this, that they will take through just standing up and telling the tale they will take culture down as deep as it is possibly possible to get. Uh, I've used the expression before, in a, in a human psyche, you have skin memory, flesh memory, and bone memory. Skin memory is the CV of your life, the events, the jobs, the opportunities. Uh, flesh memory is the stuff that was difficult the disease you went through, the depression you faced, um, the divorce you went through, the love for a child, things of significance. But bone memory is when you can tell a story from 4,000 years ago and the hairs on the back of everyone goes up because they realize in some fashion they are living through a moment in this story now. So the role of the myth teller the role of the storyteller, the role of the beauty maker is to be able to culturally take us down. But they also have to have the ritual capacities to get us back up again. I know a lot of artists who were wonderful at the journey down, but they can't get out. They can't get out. And the contract with a tribal storyteller that you trust is that they can take you down and you willingly go there because they have the function to bring you up in a way that doesn't give you the bends. 
You know, when divers come up too quick and you're crazy, there's a lot of that going on in the arts. That's why we invented ritual, is that we don't come up too quick. And stories are a way, I've worked with lots of uh, people, say, coming out of prison or returning veterans from war. They need a shield of stories to work with before they come back up to the surface. So for me, that's what the business of making beauty uh, does. It, 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 you know, a distinction I make with my students is the energy when they often turn up is this. I want to be heard. You know, my time. This is my time. And I, I get it. I get that. The trouble is myth regards that as slightly hilarious. It doesn't take it very seriously because myth asks us a deeper question. Not I want to be heard, but how do I speak? How do I speak in a way that actually alerts my soul and others that I'm really here? Um, that for me is the business of not just observing beauty, but making it. Until you start to craft beauty in some fashion in your life, not a lot will happen. Thank you for that. So just before we go, can I ask you, Dr. Shaw, um, is there anything you'd like people to know about uh, that you've got going on online that they can check out right now? Actually, there is. Um, go find me on Facebook because I'm doing something that I have never done before and may never do again. But I'm doing little video posts for stay at home kids. Um, you know, most of my work is for adults, but I really, you know, as a father, I really want to have stories that I can tell for kids and families that are at home at the moment. There are questions that they can ask each other. These are stories they can tell between each other. They're just about five minutes long. But in the last 24 hours, I think over 10,000 kids all over the world have seen them. And let's make that a million kids. Let's, let's get some myth in at a perfect moment. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh, where would they go on Facebook to find that? Just Martin Shaw, you'll find me. I have a, a page. It's a public page. Anybody can see it. Uh, and please, if you like what you're seeing, uh, the videos, I think, are called uh, Stories for Pups. Stories for Pups. Many ages. So please come find it and share it. That would be great. It's a, it's a free thing. That's it. I'm just doing it uh, because I can. Yeah. To me, the, this, that seems like a beautiful note to start bringing things to a close yeah. here. Uh, I'll just give it to you. If there's anything that, else that you'd like to say about the times that we're in, uh, any final remarks? Mm. I would say, let this moment have its way with you. If for the last 10 years you've been thinking, I really should go out and do one of those vigils. I really should go out and spend more time in nature. Well, guess what? The times have caught up, not just with you, but with me too and with everyone else. So don't close the smoke hole too early. Sit in the discomfort of our addiction to being stuffed. Pay attention to how quickly things can fall apart. And if things can seemingly culturally fall apart this quick or societally, then how do we build something that makes us not a society of taking, but a culture of giving, culture of making. So uh, I say to everybody, you know, what I say to my own kid, you know, courage, courage. Dr. Martin Jaw, thank you so much for joining us and um, wishing you all the best. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.